Bonjour. Good morning. Okay, so um, actually there's rather a lot of material, um, so you might lose lunch time. Um, I'm going to try and concentrate on a couple of things here. One is that um, when, you, when you go through the initial description of what a coroutine is, it's quite conceptually simple. But actually mapping that in your mind onto how the compiler and how the execution of this thing is going to happen, um, th that was quite difficult for me at first. So th that's one thing I'm going to concentrate on. And the other is obviously to describe how we've implemented that in the framework of GCC. Um, I'm not going to talk about two things in particular. One is why you'd want to do this. I'm going to go over it very briefly in the, in the first slide, but I don't want to be drawn into a long discussion about whether you should or shouldn't do coroutines, because as far as I'm concerned, that ship has already sailed. You have to raise a national body comment if you want to make a change to that. And the second thing is that this um, work that I'm doing at the moment is not specifically connected with optimization. I will mention certain places where we want to be able to optimize and mechanisms by which we might. But right now, the idea is to get something coherent together and to leave the door open for optimization in the future. So, first of all, as Nathan mentioned, Facebook have basically sponsored this work without which it would not be happening because it is a solid year's worth of work. Um, I, I would like to thank three people in particular, Gorn Nishinov, who is the original architect of, of this as far as the C++ community is concerned, and Lewis Baker, who is probably the world expert on writing libraries for coroutines, Nathan, who is um, not only my client in this, but also um, always a regular mentor and discusser of technical things. And actually, the guys, one or two people, have been trying to build my branch and reported bugs against it. Some of them have actually put some fairly decent code in there, which allowed me to solve problems. So thanks to them. Right, one background slide. A coroutine. Uh, everybody in the room knows what a coroutine is, of course. But um, there are a few things in compiler technology that are actually older than me. Um, and this is one of them. Uh, it was originally conceived to solve a problem where basically you wanted to reduce the amount of state that you needed between operations in a pipeline. And that particular pipeline was a compiler. And at the time that they were doing it, if you wanted to preserve state between transformations, effectively that meant writing a punch tape and reading the punch tape back in again, which was pretty tedious. So um, the first motivation on the list was that. Um, the second motivation is that two of the very largest uses of massively parallel systems, like Facebook and Google, are saying that the workloads that they face cannot be dealt with by SMT. It's just not feasible. And they are looking into alternates for how to deal with splitting the workload up and coroutines and both both those parties are vested in coroutines as one of the mechanisms. Now going right to the other end of the scale, imagine you're on a little embedded system and you don't have the resources to do multiple threading, but you've got to make a user interface or something which is a horrible, nasty, state machine-y kind of thing. And coroutines are probably a pretty good way of doing that. There was a certain reasonably famous operating system that before it transferred to a Unix base was entirely made this way. Um, so quite often when you're writing I.O. type tasks, you do something and then you establish a callback which has to be executed when something else is completed. And Rewriting that code as a coroutine actually allows you to write as a sequential piece of code so you're not mixed up with two things. Oh, I wonder what this callback does here or whatever. Um, and finally, for those of us who do signal processing work or whatever, you sometimes have a situation where your code isn't really in the right shape for SMT. And it might turn out to be that you end up with much cleaner code by rewriting it as a coroutine. 
and that's the extent of discussion on motivation. Um, there are two principal flavors of a coroutine. If you imagine that the, the, the purpose of this is that you have a function which can be suspended and resumed, actually you're all used to doing that. When you call a subroutine from with another with a function, you're effectively suspending your current one and then you resume it when the subroutine returns. Um, and the activation record for your function is on the stack. And one way of implementing coroutines is effectively to freeze the stack, put it to a side somewhere, and then pull it back in again. And there are a number of implementations of coroutines that work that way. However, a second mechanism is to say, well, we're not going to do that. We're just going to keep the activation record of our coroutine in what we were going to call a coroutine frame. And that's going to belong to the coroutine. And we're going to keep it somewhere else. That second mechanism is favored by the people who want to deal with big systems. Because essentially, freezing the stack means you need to allocate a lot of space. You need to you need to invent things like the split stack scheme that GCC has for, uh, for Go, for example. Um, and that, that is felt by some of the users to be not feasible for their intended applications. So in fact, I'm now going to move on to talk about C++20 coroutines. And C++20 coroutines are stackless. So. Um, the interesting thing is that for something that's brand new, as Nathan alluded, um, actually it's surprisingly mature. And some of the reasons for that is because it's been a fairly long path through WG21. It doesn't compete with modules, granted, but it's been a fairly long path. Um, uh, via TS and via several amendments, which predate my involvement with the committee, so there you go. Um, there are also competing technologies for resumable functions. Um, and there was quite a long debate about whether it was possible to make the coroutine into a basically a type that you could have fixed and allocate and use in the same way as you use any other first class type. Um, I'm not going to even go to the, all the various other kinds of things that are being discussed, like fibers and so on, that are possible solutions to some of the pro problems that coroutines will solve. So um, we've got implementations in Visual Studio for at least six years, I think. Um, and then in Clang and LLVM, certainly usable from seven through trunk. Um, those were both um, uh, implemented by Gornishanab. Um, who's, you know, pretty much the principal architect of a lot of this work. So, um, if you're interested, he has many more motivational examples that have been presented at CPPCon. So, if you, you, you know, just look on YouTube for, for that stuff, he, he'll give you a very animated presentation of why coroutines are a good thing. Much more than I do. So, um, and I, I mentioned Lewis Baker, his implementation of uh, a base task library and so on is available on GitHub and, and well worth a look at. So um, this is a party line. The, it is said that the primary user of coroutines is going to be people who write libraries. And that what you will do is you will present an interface from your library to the user, which doesn't mention coroutines in the slightest. and that underneath the hood, all the clever work will be done by the library writer. I'm slightly skeptical about this because I, I see a lot of people like to play with the new shiny. And I think we're going to find that actually there's a lot of non-library writers that try and use coroutines as soon as they're available. We'll see. So as far as C++20 is concerned, a coroutine is, comes into being lazily. When you write a function, you don't declare that it's a coroutine at the beginning. Um, slight irritation to me. I think from the compiler writer's point of view, it would make life a lot easier if you did. But that's what it does. When it encounters one of the coroutine-specific keywords, the function then becomes a coroutine. At that point, 
it requires certain supporting information. A, a so-called promise class, which provides some of the methods that are needed to do the work, and one or more awaitables, and the awaitables are something we shall come on to in a subsequent slide. These things are, are bound together by the compiler's emitted code and by the methods that are provided by the classes. It is one of the things that makes coroutines slightly more difficult to get up to speed on. It's, it's not enough just to look at the function which has got the coroutine um, keywords in it. You actually need to look at the supporting classes that, that do the work. So this is a very simple coroutine. Um, it's one of the coroutines in the test suite in the GCC branch. You can pull it up and look at the supporting functions that go with it. But just for the purpose of explaining what the C++ standard talks about in terms of a coroutine, we have two keywords there, um, which causes this to be recognized as a coroutine. And the standard basically says that we shall wrap did I get my pointer on to the right? We shall wrap this original function in an initial suspend and a final suspend and, uh, and wrap a try block around it. So effectively, um, it becomes something from which exceptions can't escape. Um, I'm departing very slightly from what the standard says explicitly to try and make it a little bit easier to understand what the differences are between the phases of what goes on. In practice, all the implementations make another split. Um, first of all, you have what we call the ramp function, and the ramp function establishes a, a coroutine object, what we call a struct coro1 in this, and then it, um, it executes this rewritten body. And the rewritten body may suspend, or it may not. Um, in principle, it's probably not very useful if it never suspends. But there are cases you can envisage where the, the coroutine could actually run to completion within that. Um, so in my case here, the ramp function would do some setup stuff. It would call this second body, which would hit the first potential pause point, the first co-await, co and, and probably stop there. The standard then says, if you see a co-yield, that actually corresponds to rewriting that code in terms of a co-await and um, calling a method in your promise which yields a value. It also says that you rewrite a co-return as um, a call to your promise a method in your promise class again, and then just going to final suspend. So right now, we've transformed the three, key the three keywords have already become just one keyword. So the only keyword we need to worry about now is, is the co-await. And this is completely unreadable. <laughs> okay. Um, so what the co-await does is it um, acts upon an awaitable object. And the awaitable object has to have three methods. One method says, is this thing ready? And the next method says, suspend this thing. And then the final method says, and resume this thing. Um, and the, the code transformation, which you probably can see on the top one, is to say, if this awaitable thing isn't ready, prepare to suspend it, suspend it, and this is where the magic occurs. This is where the non-obvious part occurs. What happens at this point is that your function returns from within that scope, but without destroying the scope. Um, we also then create a, a, a route whereby the object can be destroyed. So we've initialized an awaitable here. If we need to destroy this thing, then we need to destroy that, and we need to go on and destroy whatever else might be 
created elsewhere. Um, unfortunately, what's in the two unreadable pieces of code is there are actually three flavors of awaitables. In one flavor of awaitable, the suspend method returns void, and it does what we've got described at the top there. In the second, in the second version, it returns a Boolean, and when you execute the suspend method, it can say, oh, no, actually, I'm really ready. You can carry on. So it never actually goes into the suspend case. But it, in the third case, um, it's unfortunate that you can't see that. In the third case, it returns a coroutine handle. And the coroutine handle provides you with a mechanism to resume another coroutine. So at this point, we achieve one of, the, one of the more important things that people want. And that is basically we have a continuation. So that um, you never actually return to your caller. You actually continue another coroutine. So if you imagine that you had some function that was keeping stack keeping a stack of possible things to be executed. And when you call the suspend method, it gives you the next one, and then you continue that. And one of the important things about this is that with the stackless coroutine, if you tail call this, you can do this in for infinity. You, you never need any more stack space. So it's actually quite important that we can construct the call that you can't see here as a tail call. Um, and there's one slight glitch in the wording of the standard right now about that. But in the tail position of the function, that's achievable right now. So um, each time we encounter an await expression in a function, we, we index it. So we start off with the zeroth one. And in fact, in the GCC implementation, we step by two because that allows me to make some uh, easier thing to do with the destroy functions. Um, we, we rewrite the top of the actor function to be basically a dispatcher. Um, and that says, what, what index are you at? And, and then executes the code that belongs to that index. It would be conceivably possible to do it other ways, um, but this, in all the implementations that are out there, that's actually the way that this is done. It turns out to be more efficient to do it this way. Um, the standard also specifies the coroutine handle. Um, it was never intended to read this entire slide, and it isn't readable. Um, the The point is that this the coroutine handle binds together the resume the destroy, and the promise. And what it means is if you have a pointer to a promise, you can get the coroutine handle from that. And if you have a handle to a coroutine, you can get the promise from that. And you can find out where to execute your resume and destroy methods. So in summary, um, actually, the way the standard is written, C++ 20 coroutines are actually implemented more or less by a series of source-to-source -source transformations. Um, you have a handle to a coroutine which allows you to resume it or destroy it. And I would say it's a fair bet that most of the heavy lifting in your code is not actually going to be in your coroutine body. It's probably going to be in your awaitables and, and in your promise because those are the things that you have to figure out how you're going to pass data around. Awaitables only have a lifetime across their suspend point, so they're useful for carrying a bit of data that you might wish to return or assign, but they, they have no long-term storage. The promise is a place you can put stuff because that persists, persists for the entirety, entire duration of the coroutine. And usually that's where people put things that they want to return. Um, actually, there are only really two pieces of special new compiler goop that are needed to make this work. One is that you need to have some way of, con of containing an activation record that persists across invocations. Um, and in reality, for the compilers that I know about anyway, that really means that you allocate it on the heap rather than the stack. There are ways 
and there is a, an important op optimization for some categories of coroutine where it turns out that you can inline the whole of the code and therefore you can allocate the frame on the stack. But for most coroutines, you're probably going to end up putting it on the heap. And the second exciting thing is you have to provide this mechanism for exiting a scope without clearing up. So basically, you want to return from the middle of nowhere, and you don't want to touch what you're doing when you return. ABI. Um, it, it is, um, of course, the case that the standard tells you what you should do, but not how you should do it. But it's also the case that we certainly want to interwork with the other compilers that are present on systems. So we want to interwork with Clang, and we want to interwork with VS. Um, and the guys from the three compiler groups have got together and we've discussed what would be a reasonable ABI. I'm actually the editor of that document. It's not public yet, but I'll come to that later. Um, what we describe really is that a minimal part of the coroutine state has to be laid out in a particular way so that one compiler can know that it can resume a coroutine which was compiled by another compiler. Um, we also describe a common set of built-ins because um, there is a part of this, the, um, the header part of the library that actually has a few, uh, needs a few of the built-ins. And rather than everybody having their own name for them, it just makes sense that we all keep the same name. And therefore, conceivably, Clang can compile GCC's headers and vice versa. Um, essentially, there isn't a lot to this. Um, the, the, lay, the, the calling convention, the um, function signature and the positions of the resume and destroy methods need to be known. And the position and how to get at the promise needs to be known. And it needs to be that the promise is laid out according to the regular C++ ABI on the platform. So is that if you can call C++ code from your compiler, you know you can call methods in that promise without a problem. Beyond that, the implementation can do more or less what it likes. So it may be that the implementation decides to allocate memory either side of those objects so that it can, for example, optimize offsets, whatever, that, you know, no particular constraints there. GCC's implementation. At the beginning, before we actually started the work, um, we had a design document which Nathan authored, and it was quite middle-end centric, um, with the idea that you would sort of discover what you needed to save along the way, and that you would do some kind of um, outlining of the resume and destroy functions, um, poss possibly making use of the nested function functionality that GCC already has for C. Um, while we were looking at the ABI side of things, we were also reviewed what um, Clang was doing and what Gore had implemented there. And actually, what he does there is, is something of a very similar idea, um, where Essentially, the, the the ramp and the the ramp and the resume and destroy functions are actually outlined very late in the middle end of the compiler. Now, um, it turns out that when we looked at that mechanism in conjunction with the way that GCC's LTO works, that doesn't map quite so well. What we'd really like to do is to be able to use the IPA stuff before the streaming and do whatever analysis is possible there. Um, actually, I have an implementation which does some of the outlining later, and I have an implementation which does the outlining early, and the second one actually works a whole lot better. So, um, as I pointed out in the, in the initial part of this, it actually turns out that most of what the standard talks about in terms of a coroutine can be expressed in terms of source-to-source -source transformations. It, it's not very middle-endy, really. It's quite front-endy. So um, 
the implementation that I have at the moment actually transforms the outlining problem into an inlining problem. I outline the ramp and the what I've called an actor function, which, which combines the functionality of the resume and destroy in much the same way as the Clang implementation does. And, and I provide a stub function for the destroy, which actually sets a flag and then calls the second function. Now, the idea of this is that essentially, if you could have rewritten it by doing a source-to-source -source transformation, I don't need to do anything clever in the middle end. I just give the middle end what the user would have written if they had done the source-to-source -source transformations. And this is great from my point of view because the middle end's a scary place. And, you know, it's, it's better to try and leverage all the clever things it does already rather than invent a whole bunch of new ones. Or at least that's my philosophy. So, um, I'm trying to make the implementation as uninvasive as possible. Um, that makes my life easier, and it ho hopefully it makes review easier when it comes to incorporate it. Um, so in the front end parser, we don't have a whole lot of work to do here. We, we have to recognize the three new keywords. Um, if we can, we can do semantic checks on the parts of the promise and the awaitables that are prescribed by the standard once you've engaged one of those keywords. Um, in practice, you can't do all of that because people are going to write templated classes and you're not going to be able to actually do the semantic checks on the methods in the promise until you actually know what the type of the promise is, for example. We have the public built-ins, which are the ones that are prescribed by the ABI to transform between promise and handle and a couple of other things which I'll describe later. Um, macro definitions, so we, we have a, a CPP Coro um, macro which broadcasts the, the version of, of, the, of the implementation. Um, obviously handling the flag. But everything else is pretty much deferred until after template instantiation time. We have a, a process now where we're going to do the source-to-source -source transformations necessary to achieve this. And th this basically takes our original function and morphs it into a ramp function, an actor function, and this outlined destroy function that is basically a stub. Um, as I said, the intent then is to allow the IPA passes in the, in the middle end to get a pretty good visibility of how big the ramp function is and hopefully uh, allow it to be in line early. Um, there's an interesting anecdote here, which is that the Clang implementation tries extremely hard to do a lot of inlining. And the motivation for that is because there is this circumstance in which you can inline the whole of the coroutine, and then you can allocate the coroutine frame on the stack instead of a heap. So it's pretty aggressive at doing that. The downside of that is you might actually end up with finding that when you implement things in coroutines, you end up with much bigger code than you had before. Um, and that at least one observer has made that comment that it might not always be the right thing to do. So the, the way that we've done this now means that we, we're actually in command of whether we decide to outline or not. The outlining problem is now an inlining problem. I have a stub function, and, it, and it's up to the middle end to decide whether it's valuable to inline that or not, at which point it becomes effectively what I would have outlined later. Um, the ramp function is pretty much completely compiler-generated code. Um, it allocates the frame. It has to deal with two circumstances um, one, one is where there is a provision for a failure in allocation, and the other is where basically it just throws an exception. Um, it constructs the, the promise object in the frame. That's part of what you actually need to progress through this. If you have um, function arguments that are not 
that are used beyond the construction of the promise, and then they have to be copied into the frame as well, or moved into the frame, depending on the, the type of argument. Um, we, uh, we then effectively execute the rewritten function body. So we call that. Um, it's expected it'll suspend and it'll return to us. It might not. It might go off and continue something else. But uh, in any event, assuming that it does suspend and it returns to us, we now return the coroutine object to our caller. caller. So the, the signature that we had at the, the original signature, which was struck coro one, foo, blah, 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 that returns an object of a coroutine. And that may contain a handle for the coroutine, which allows the person who created it to manipulate it. Um, it may not. It may be that the, in an asynchronous task, you just assume that the, the, the coroutine is going to progress along in some other way. Um, one thing we do defer until late in the middle end is the decision on how big the coroutine frame is going to be. So that's an optimization which doesn't happen right now, but which is allowed for. So um, although we have to create the coroutine frame in the ramp, we don't have to decide how big it is until we've done the middle end processing. And we may eliminate variables from the coroutine frame during that. Um, we, build a, we build up a a prototype or a, an initial coroutine frame, um, which has the ABI mandated layout, of course, and then um, mechanism to decide where we're going to resume or destroy. And the simple imp implementation is to have an index, and that's basically what we do. It's basically what I think Clang and VS do the same thing, essentially. Um, we need to contain any parameters which are used within the coroutine body. We need to preserve um, the awaitables across their suspend points. We know all these things at this point. And we need to preserve any variable which is live across the suspend point. Um, in order to make best use of the Gimplifier and what it currently does, the mechanism that I've used is to hide the early return, the special return, by means of a, an internal function. Um, and then basically we save, all the, we save all the local variables into the frame. And that means that in the middle end, it just looks like regular code. And therefore, if the compiler doesn't save something back to the frame that needs to be saved, that's just a regular bug. It's not a coroutine special bug. So um, we construct the actor function, we insert the wrapper around it that the standard mandates, and uh, we then start to rewrite the content of it according to what the standard says. So first of all, um, we, we rewrite co-returns co into basically a, a call to the promise method and then a jump to the end. Um, we rewrite each awaitable into um, there is going to be a PDF of this, which will actually allow you to read what there is there. Um, essentially, each awaitable gets turned into a piece of code, which tests to see if it's ready and goes for a suspend if it doesn't. This this barely readable code built in is the magic hiding of the return that that exits from within a scope. Um, in the case that you have had a, once you've created a suspend point, you may be in a position where you need to destroy something from it. Quite a few awaitables are trivial, and they don't really need a destructor, but not all of them. Some of them do need a destructor. So you have a point here where you may elect to um, destroy the awaitable and then go to wherever it is that you need to go to destroy the frame. Um, when the coroutine is resumed, either because it was already ready or because it's gone off and done something else and then you come in through the resume entry point, you recover the value via the, uh, any value that is used, um, 
via this um, promise, that by the awaitable await resume method. And that's, that's actually the, the complete encoding of every await point. Um, and finally then, uh, to, to finish off the function, what you need is a dispatcher. So you say, pick up the index from the frame and then basically jump to the piece of code, uh, jump to the resume or destroy point as appropriate that was um, generated in the previous expansion. So really, we haven't done anything exciting here. We've just translated one set of C++ into another set of C++. OK, not very c plus because it's got lots of go-tos and things in it. But essentially, it's, it's um, front-end kind of language stuff. This is good. I like the fact that you're not going to have to come to me and ask for a middle-end tweak. There is, um, there is no middle end tweak. There is a lowering of one internal function which does the quotes clever bit, unquote. And actually, my goal in life was, it, was to do it the least clever way possible. Honestly, that is the truth. I do, I do not want to invent something clever. Right, my destroy stub is really this simple. That is the entirety of it. It says, if it's an odd number, it's a destroy. If it's an even number, it's a resume. End of story. So you can imagine that um, if the middle end looks through the, the actor function, and as we would expect, the destroy pathway is going to be pretty small because basically each resume, each destroy point is potentially going to destroy an awaitable and then jump to the part of the code that destroys the coroutine frame. So the likelihood is the destroy function would be quite small and probably it will get outlined into that. But it doesn't have to be. That, that, that's the point is that we have flexibility. We're not forcing it to be outlined if it's not preferential for the, as determined by the regular analysis of the compiler. Okay, so here was the middle end stuff is just two slides now instead of what I expected to be the entire presentation originally. The built-ins are really pretty trivial to expand. Essentially, um, because of the coroutine frame layout is mandated in terms of the relationship between the resume, the destroy pointers, and the promise, most of the activity turns out to be pointer plus offset and do something. In one case, um, when you're expanding the built-in curve promise thing, Essentially, you're saying, if I've got a promise and I want to handle, or if I've got a handle and I want to promise, so it's basically point to plus offset, done, job done. And similarly, when you are, um, you're calling the destroy or the resume methods, really all you're doing is finding an offset and doing an indirect jump through it. One of the reasons the ABI is the way it is is because the resume method is at zero offset from the coroutine pointer, the frame pointer. And that means that on some platforms, x86, for example, it's a very efficient indirect call. Um, I, I, I'll come to that if there's any time left, which there is just about. Um, actually, one of the things we don't do terribly well in GCC is the devirtualization of, this, of these calls which means that we don't exploit the opportunity to inline the functions where we can. Because essentially what you need to have done is to, first of all, devirtualize the resume call, and then secondly, to recognize that it was worthwhile to inline the resume function. That may be something, I, I know Hans is working on this, so it may all suddenly burst into life. This is great, because it's not my problem. <laughs> um, and then there's a, there's a, a a coroutine um, built in that says, is this coroutine done? Um, and that really is trivially just comparing a pointer to zero. OK, so the clever bit of the middle end is this. We take this internal function and we, re we rewrite it as a go-to. <laughs> um, so um, joking aside, the point of this is that we have 
gone through the gimplification, we have used all the clever stuff that deals with lifetime management. I really did not want to. Lifetime management is nasty. And there's still some bits of it I don't like very much. <laughs> um, I didn't want to have to reinvent any of that stuff. So by hiding this return from the gimplification of C++ code, essentially um, it doesn't see that edge coming out. And therefore, it doesn't try to put the cleanups on that edge, which we don't want. And once we've gone past that point, we can rewrite that edge into a regular go-to. And the rest of the middle end now sees the correct code. It now sees the, the configuration, the, the, the CFG that it, it should expect for this. We've just avoided having to put the cleanups on and take them off again or whatever other scheme that we would have come up with. Now, um, we encapsulate the fact that we've yielded and the um, fact that we may wish to resume or destroy a, a coroutine. We actually have to do something to keep those bits of code in place. Otherwise, um, they will look like dead code and be eliminated. And we do this by having a, an internal function which we've called co-yield and internal functions which are called co-actor. So in my dispatcher, each dispatch entry has a co-actor, and in my, uh, uh, in my um, suspend point, each suspend point has a yield, and the yield ties up the resume and destroy re-entry points until later in the compilation. This is one occasion which um, optimization is being considered at this point. The reason for doing this is that if you actually write the code out in full at the beginning, then it all, it all looks like it's used. And what you would like is the situation where um, if you have something where you can prove that the await ready there is a constant value, so you know whether it's ready or not, then what you want is for the ability for, for that resume point to be elided completely at that point. And if, if the destroy in there is apparently reachable, then that can't happen. So it's a, just a question of putting that, that particular thing aside until after basically constant propagation has taken place or whatever. Um, right at the very end, just before expansion, um, we compute the size of the coroutine frame. Um, right now, there is no optimization being done on that. But the intent is that essentially you eliminate any variables from the coroutine frame that are never used. Because one of the comments about coroutines is putting, you know, putting space on the heap is people don't like to do that for whatever reason. So um, if we can... Um, if we can, in subsequent optimizations, reduce the amount of space that the coroutine frame takes up. Um, and then that's a rewriting that we can do late in the middle end. So um, where are we now? Um, slightly behind time. Um, pretty much everything is in place. We can build reasonably sophisticated coroutines, and they work. Um, of course, this is like hot off the press a week or two ago, and I'm sure that it's going to, going to encounter bugs. Luckily, there have been some third parties who've been giving me code and building the stuff, so it's not all my code. I mean, obviously, my own code is likely to work, but um, fortunately, some other people have been um, pushing code my way, and, and that invariably uncovers things that I hadn't thought about and... Uh, and is leading to a better implementation. Um, C++ 20 is now at the ballot stage. So conceivably, national bodies could make comments which change details to do with the way this implementation is. Um, I, they can't make a comment that changes the design. I suppose there is an outside chance that somebody could make a comment that got the facility withdrawn altogether. But other than that, scenario, we can expect it to be in C++20 and without 
a radically altered design from the one that we have here. Um, so my intention now is to clean up, um, to get the patches posted before the end of stage one, and depending on um, enthusiasm and review bandwidth, hopefully to get this into GCC 10, um, so that it'll be there for the um, release of C20. A few references there, the, the working draft, um, the branches in the normal places. I've, I keep it up to date on GitHub because some people who've been responding and giving me bug reports uh, are preferring to post them there because we obviously we've not got anything on Bugzilla for this at the moment because it's not part of it. Um, um, there is a, an entry on the wiki. I admit I don't update it as often as I might, but it is there. Um, Lewis's library. Um, the ABR document, as I said, I'd come back to this. It isn't published yet. If there's anybody in the room who feels that they want to be involved in it at this stage, just ask me and I'll give you a link to it. Um, it's not a secret or anything. It's just that it's been circulated to about 20 people so far and actually only three of them have commented. So <laughs> um, okay. We've got, we've got 10 minutes before lunch. Uh, so what you do with some corner cases, like uh, if the coroutine function has VLAs, built-in alloca, uh, set jump, long jump, do you, do you error, uh, di diagnose it in the front end or uh, what you do in these cases because you can do the frame correctly in that case or if it's, a, if it's an object that you have to allocate in the frame, then, then it will be done in the, in the front-end transformation. So uh, Alaka, I can't answer specifically off the top of my head, but obviously we, the, the current implementation does handle um, objects that require constructors. Yeah, yeah, but for VLA, you need to allocate the stack dynamically, and you can't preserve that across, well, would need to do an allocation, an he extra heap allocation for each. Um, I think, it, in fact, you can't do an alloca in this way. What you will have to do is to transform the alloca into a, a malloc because the object that you're allocating has to persist for the duration of the... Yep. So you'd have a pointer in the frame. And, and the answer is, yeah, that's going to make it fall over right now. <laughs> but, but basically, it cannot be because you have no stack. It, Yeah, your, your activation record has been replaced by this coroutine frame. So if we have a VLA or we have a, a, an alloca, what we'll have to do is to allocate a pointer and then malloc that. Yeah, I, I don't know offhand whether alloca and VLAs are actually... VLAs aren't a C++ thing. Yes, yeah, certainly, but so, users so can actually yes, type yeah, it. So no, you saying, can error yeah, if, if yeah, you want. I, and, but I don't know what... I, it's probably a national body comment saying that it be clear that allocate is not a thing you can do in these these routines. I can't remember offhand if that's already there. Um, uh, but your question is, yeah, I suspect what we'll, we will need to do to emit errors at the very least, and yeah, not, not to try and handle th them. That's, at this that's point. fine for me. Just just that's something to to have test cases for. It, it, it may be that that's already banned in the standard. I don't remember. So I haven't looked into that in detail and don't know if that's actually a valid, but um, obviously you say you determine the frame size at the very end of the middle end, but I mean some areas of the frame for a normal function are only use the back end, like for example spill areas for register locator. Is this something that can happen that there's a spill slot that would be alive across the suspension point? No. No, 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 not at all. So, so, that, so you you yeah. create virtual registers, and if you're running out of real registers to put your virtual registers in, that whatever's in there has to be spilled. Right. Okay. So I I can answer that. Remember, I said that what we've done is to rewrite this in terms of what looks like a regular function, and I also said therefore, if we screw up, then it means we've just screwed up as a regular bug. Right. So that cannot happen 
what, what I'm saying is if you've got an object that's allocated in the frame and you return without saving the value back to that, that's just a regular bug. It's got nothing to do with coroutines at all. Because when you put the code into the middle end, you'd already rewritten it into a form which just looks like regular code. There's nothing special coroutine about it. So it's like saying, if I've got struct A and it's got B in it, um, and, and for some reason the middle end fails to rewrite the value back into that before returning from the function, that's just a regular bug. Uh, so a suspension point, maybe that's the point I'm not getting, a suspension point looks to the middle end as a return from the function? Yeah. So, that, the, so uh, the magic return, sorry, the magic return is the bit that's hard to get your head around in this because it, it, okay. it comes from the middle of nowhere. But once it's been rewritten into that edge and presented to the middle end as that edge, if the middle end doesn't do the right things on that edge, then that's just a regular bug. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, uh, when I say middle end, I mean also back end as well. The back end really shouldn't enter into this at all, this discussion. Everything should be over by the time you've done expand. Uh, uh, so, so, you, so you say backend doesn't uh, kick you in, right? Uh, but uh, the way you can you can round, uh, write code with coroutines is uh, uh, so you can do like a really long chain of calls, which will run out of stack normally. If you translate it to normal functions, it runs out of stack. Right. So, so um, the point about the coroutine resume method. And the coroutine resume method and the coroutine destroy method are void functions which simply take a single pointer. And the intention is that there is that you always tail call that. Yeah, you you hope you always tail call them. Which is pretty much what there we is have a, in GCC now. I, I will admit there's a problem with that at the moment, which is outside outside of my remit, which is that basically if the destroy method Sorry, if the resume method is not marked no except, then there are some places that you can't tell call it. But in the f in the normal position that you would tell call it in the in the final suspend, you're okay there because that's marked as as no except in that position. Um, that's actually something that's an ongoing discussion and will end up as national body comments anyway. So, and and Gore's already working on that too. So you're right. If you fail to tail call, then eventually you can blow the stack. Yep. I don't think that's any different from any other program. No, but it's uh, 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 it's one of the uh, one of the problems you actually try to solve with coroutines. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, agreed, agreed. Um, a actually, even with my green implementation, we do produce the tail calls. So cool. um, I was quite pleased about that. <laughs> I didn't have to do anything special to make it happen. You just have to compile with the right um, optimization in the middle end. Um, I, I'm concerned personally about what happens when you try and debug and you really don't want to be operating at that level of... So you've got this situation where it's not going to work unless you have at least enough optimization to tail call. Yeah. But on the other hand, you don't want that much optimization to be able to debug. I don't know that there's a good answer to that yet. It may just be one of those horrible situations that you sometimes have to debug at O2. <laughs> I thought David Malcolm maybe two years ago added a uh, must tail call attribute that in theory, and I haven't looked, but in theory should work without optimization. Okay. Um, there was a lot of discussion about must tail call in the WG21, um, and I haven't actually investigated that because the end result of that was we're not going to make that requirement. But if GCC can do it, and I haven't looked at David Malcolm's thing, so I will look at that, then it might be worth annotating it and find out how many times it falls over at least. Uh, and about inlining, uh, you said that uh, you don't try to inline coroutines aggressively, but uh, so uh, you added an additional parameter to control inlining for coroutines, or you just uh, reuse standard GCC inlining? 
it's actually just using standard GCC and lining. I, um, the distinction I was making is that LLVM's middle end inlining is much more aggressive than GCC's. Ah, okay, so that's not about carotenes at all, that's just about inlining? Not, no, not specifically about carotenes. Ah, okay, no, no. thank you. Um, it, and it turns out that you might not want to inline all your carotenes anyway. Um, you can you can imagine that if the body of the carotene is doing significant work, the overhead of the indirect call is tiny by comparison. Uh, basically, I'm more concerned about code size because uh, we had issues with uh, inlining and uh, code blotting. Uh, that ma that has been already reported as an issue with carotenes, as compiled um, by Klein. So. For the debugging, I think you run into similar cases as, as with, because you outline parts of the function, at least from, from what I understood, uh, you run into the same thing as with OpenMP outlining and OpenACC and, and the partial function inlining and so on. So I guess we need to design some dwarf extensions so that the debugger will actually be able to debug coroutines. Yeah, early on in the discussion, um, you know, more than a year ago now, there was some talk about maybe we'd need some dwarf extension to make this debugging a little bit more um, sensible. I mean, I, having said that, um, when I have had to debug so far, I haven't had too much of a problem, but my coroutines are pretty simple because they're mostly test cases. The point here, Jakob, I think is this is a common issue that we're seeing across anything that does, you know, heterogeneous open ACC, open MP, coroutines. We, we should be looking at, at what extensions we need to handle uh, these cases and, and partial outlining and specialization. And I just don't think we've really looked at that yet. That mostly people have, have done. Okay, maybe you're hungry. 